All right, so let's talk about code smells. The fundamental idea behind this is, uh, as I already mentioned, this is code that doesn't specifically have any errors. It's code that compiles, it's code that uh, functions correctly, but um, it's code that indicates structural problems. So um, whenever you encounter code smells, then this will just make it more likely that in the future you will have uh, bugs or issues when maintaining the code. Maybe if you come back to your code half a year later and try to, to understand what you what you did uh, the, and you have a lot of code smells, then they will make it harder even for yourself to understand what's going to, ha uh, to happen actually and what's going on in there. Sometimes it's also called lint or fuss, uh, just like the stuff you find in your uh, washing machine. It's not something that uh, causes problems right away, but if you let it accumulate for too long, then at some point um, it will start to become an issue. Um, and uh, for example, compilers often um, already catch specific types of these code smells. Uh, for example, if you turn on compiler warnings, like uh, in the C compiler, GCC, for example, this is the minus warn all switch, wall uh, for short, and that will actually already catch quite a number of uh, code smells that may indicate problems um, and that aren't specifically bugs, the code will still compile if you uh, turn on the warnings, but uh, the compiler will tell you about things that might be fishy and might cause problems in the future. All right, so let's have a look at uh, some of these code smells that have a general impact on just the understandability of the code. So if you have code that's uh, unused, that will never be called, for example, or variables that are never used, then um, they just clutter the the uh, overall um, the overall architecture and uh, will also in increase the size of your compiled binary. In some cases, sometimes the compiler might actually optimize them out, but in many cases they will hang around, especially if it's if it's unused code. Um, so this is something you should at least comment out or uh, clean up if you don't actually need it. Um, if you have a rather long method, something around uh, 50 lines of code, or maybe uh, one screen is usually considered like the, the limit, um, then it will just become a lot harder to understand what's happening. And if it's, if it's larger than that, you sh might consider splitting it up into different methods because uh, that will also help to understand what's going on in the future. Um, then if you have so-called magic values in your code, so lots of, of uh, just plain numbers that has, have some sort of meaning, for example, for some kind of network protocol or port numbers or whatever. Um, and the more of these plain numbers you have without explanation, the, the harder it will be be to, to actually understand what's going on. So for this, you should use named constants or uh, static variables to hold these and give give each uh, individual number actually an, an, a meaningful name so uh, that you can also easier understand what's going on. And uh, if you have something like six different if statements stacked into each other, this would then be the a, a too high depth of uh, so-called conditional nesting. So um, because by the time you, you actually are understanding what's happening in the innermost if statement, you are very likely to, to forget what the outermost one uh, did in the first place. So if you have too many levels of, of uh, conditions, then you might want to, to consider to kind of merge them, for example, using uh, using Boolean conditions, uh, and and or and so on, um, or again to split them out into, uh, into other uh, methods. All right, other code smells that also happen quite a lot are um, too short identifiers. So if you call your variables or methods just A, B, C, uh, E, X, and so on, then um, it's going to be a lot more difficult to, to know what's going on later on. Uh, in some very old languages like Fortran, you actually didn't have a choice. You just could use single letters, but in Java and C and so on, luckily we are not constrained by that anymore. So we can use actually proper names. Um, 
you can actually overdo that too. So if you have something like this loop here, where the, the, inner, the inner variable is actually called loop variable and loop maximum and so on, um, then that was, this is also too much of a good thing basically. So this will make it harder to read the code too. So you should definitely pick some something in the middle. So if you just have a simple loop and then it's actually not a problem to call the, the loop variable i or n or whatever. Um, but if all of your identifiers have just these single letter uh, uh, names, then of course it's going to be confusing. Um, a very good general problem is lack of comments. Um, so you should definitely write comments into your code, especially uh, if, for the trickier parts, also for yourself that a week later or a month later, you still understand what's actually going on there. Um, once again, there's also too much of a good thing. So you can overdo comments. Uh, if you comment every single line, even the trivial ones, then um, uh, people won't really uh, look at the comments at all anymore and will miss the important ones too. So there's also kind of a, a sweet spot of the right amount of comments basically to have, um, but it's definitely not zero. So no comments at all won't help either. Um, what other code smells are there, especially regarding maintenance? So if you have duplicated code, let's say there's three statements that are always executed in the same order and this happens several times in your code, then you should definitely pack these into a, a, its own method and just call that method because there's obviously a, a specific sequence these things have to, to happen in. And um, if you then change one of them or uh, change the order at some point and forgot the other thing, then you have a bug on your hands. Um, redundant code is also uh, something that you might miss uh, at some point in the future. So if you have uh, the same statement nested several times, uh, it doesn't have to be as obvious as here, of course, then you can just remove the inner uh, condition and di directly execute the statements because if you're already in the uh, in the first, inside the first condition, then the other one will be executed too. Empty statements are also a problem, of course, because then the, the uh, condition test will still be executed, but it won't have any effect usually. And this is also just cluttering up your code. Um, a very, very uh, nasty code smell actually are these side effects and conditions. This is not something that's possible in Java, but it is possible in C and C++. And sometimes people actually use that intentionally um, because if it, this is valid code in C, um, and what it does is it first assigns the value of B to A and then evaluates the, uh, the new value of A, whether it's zero or not and then it will execute the inner part. But in a lot of cases, this is unintentional. Uh, if you actually intended to just compare A and B um, and forgot one, one equal sign, then this will still be valid code. In fact, uh, all, almost all recent C compilers will, uh, will flag that at least as a warning because it's such, a, such an ugly bug that can happen quite quite easily by accident and that sometimes uh, uh, causes quite a lot of headache trying to track that down. All right. Um, other code smells uh, on a structural level are if you have, for example, too many parameters for your method. Um, usually anything above five is not a good idea. And this is actually related to, to the short-term memory of, of humans because there's a rule of thumb that most people will be able to hold something like seven items in their short-term memory. And so the idea behind that is if you look at the uh, documentation for a method and uh, let's say it's it's 10 different items, then this is 10 different parameters, then it's simply too much to, to keep in, in memory. And then you will have to switch back and forth between the documentation and your code uh, all the time. Uh, if it's just three parameters, then it's quite easy to remember to which, uh, which one is which basically. 
Of course, this is something that many IDEs can help you with to actually show a kind of hint or tooltip which parameter you're, you're entering now uh, when you're uh, uh, writing a method call. But still also for the general understandability, it's usually a good idea to avoid having too many parameters for a method. And if you need a lot more, then you maybe need to consider to pack them into an array or something like that. If you have too many local variables, this is also related, of course, to the size of the code, then this might also cause understandability issues because you just can't remember all the, the variables uh, anymore, what they do and what values they might hold. Uh, similar for um, member variables in a class. And uh, also related to object-oriented programming now, if you have one really large class in your project, this is sometimes also called the God object, which basically accumulates all the functionality and doesn't really split off anything into, into other classes, then this is also a problem because this is quite, even if the individual methods are small enough, then the uh, total functionality of this, this class is so complex that it becomes difficult to keep track of what's happening actually. So this is also something that you just should split up into uh, different classes or maybe subclasses and so on. So that's also uh, a, a code smell in the, um, in the sense that it will just make it more difficult to, to handle the code in the future. Um, also, especially related to, to object-oriented programming, there are a couple of specific uh, code smells that aren't so much related to the, to the t syntax and the structure of the code itself, but rather to the classes. So, for example, if you have a very uh, deep uh, hierarchy of inheritance with subclasses of subclasses of subclasses and so on, then this might be uh, an issue because then you also lose track of uh, how, how, where in the hierarchy you actually are and what your superclasses are and what functionality th they provide. Um, this is something you might want to reconsider. Then there's uh, something called feature envy, which is when you uh, use another class yeah, quite a lot, so almost exclusively rely on another class for uh, specific functions. Um, However, of course, there are some design patterns that actually kind of require you to do that. I'll leave you a moment to think about which, which one those actually are. Um, then if you um, override too much functionality of your base class in a subclass and uh, you cannot actually replace the functionality of the base class with a, a subclass anymore, then this is also kind of, a, this is still possible, of course, but it's uh, a violation of this so-called substitution principle that you should always be able to, um, to replace a base class object by any subclass. And... Um, Last but not least, what's also sometimes a problem, especially in larger projects, is that you um, try to use so many patterns, templates, um, variants, and, and so on, that you kind of also lose track of the individual parts. I have to admit that uh, a project I worked on during my PhD uh, was kind of um, falling into that trap. So at some point we had I think like four levels of nested templates and probably uh, five, la uh, five levels of inheritance hierarchy and you just couldn't really keep track of which specific subclass you were working on right now anymore. So this is also a, a, a big issue. All right, so um, I'd like to point out one specific uh, object-oriented um, issue, which is sometimes called the diamond problem. This is something that will only happen in C++. This is not really possible in Java. But um, the idea here is that you have a, a shared base class widget here. Then you have two different subclasses that inherit from widget, which is label and button, which is kind of straightforward. Um, but then uh, in C++, you can have multiple inheritance. For example, you can uh, create a subclass text button here that is a subclass of both 
button and label. And um, now let's say that this widget class, which is kind of a sensible approach, has a draw function that will actually draw the individual element uh, on screen. Um, but now if we call this draw method in text button, is it the one from this subclass or the one from this subclass? This isn't something that uh, is, is unsolvable. You can, of course, work around that in C++, otherwise this multiple inheritance approach wouldn't actually work. But uh, in many cases, this is an indicator of that the uh, overall design is simply too complex and should be should maybe be simplified. All right, so one other rule of thumb that uh, also helps to, to keep your code clean is the so-called law of uh, Demeter. And um, the idea here is that you want to, to have each individual component in your code only loosely coupled to the rest. Um, there's a very a uh, very rough uh, summary of this law of Demeter, which is only talk to your direct friends. And that means that your class should only call its own methods, methods of parameter objects, methods of objects that are in instance variables, and methods of objects it has created on its own. And whenever you don't look at the, uh, whenever you disregard the law of Demeter, that means that you need knowledge about how the other classes are structured internally. And this is actually something you would like to avoid. So I'll show you an example. Let's say we have a uh, class motor and we have a car that includes a motor. Um, and then we have a driver that uh, wants to, to uh, use a car and start it. Um, and then the violation of the law of Demeter is actually uh, sometimes summarized. If you're using in Java, then you should only use one dot. And as you can see, this statement actually uses two dots because it first refers to an object in another class, and then it calls a method on that other object. Because this object is public, this is possible. Um, and a better, de better design that does not uh, violate the law of Demeter would be to um, have a method, let's say, get ready, that actually starts the motor. Um, and then the driver class will not directly call start on that motor class, but it will ra rather call get ready and that will delegate internally the uh, method uh, to the method of the motor which is now private. So this is uh, simply a way to ensure that encapsulation is, is maintained. All right.